Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to KSWV Radio. We have a wonderful, wonderful conversation that we're going to have this morning with Dr. Raymond Newell with Los Alamos National Laboratory. Welcome, Dr. Newell. Thank you for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the interest. It's great to have an opportunity here to to speak to my friends, family, and colleagues in northern New Mexico. Thank you for having me. Well, it's our pleasure, and I know that we're going to be talking about a very important conversation series, uh, lecture series that will be taking place right around the corner. However, we want to let our radio listeners know a little bit about yourself and those watching in social media. Uh, Dr. Newell, uh, let me read your bio, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, okay. you know who you are and introduce uh, yourselves to our listening audience. But Dr. Newell is a research scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has been employed there since 2003, holds a doctorate in atomic, molecular, and optical physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He leads the quantum communications team at Los Alamos and is deputy group leader for the Materials, Physics, and Applications Quantum Group. His research interests span the broad range of quantum information sciences for national security. In addition, Dr. Newell is the chief optical scientist for the SuperCam Body Unit, a suite of remote sensing instruments aboard NASA's uh, Perseverance rover on Mars. Uh, Dr. Newell, very impressive uh, background. Uh, Tell our listening audience uh, uh, why you chose to go into this field and a little bit more about yourself. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, You know, Esteban, I got into this field of uh, doing and building things in physics and in optics, mostly just because I love building stuff and working with my hands and putting things together. It probably started with... uh, Far too many childhood afternoons spent uh, assembling Lego sets, uh, taking everything apart, putting it back together, uh, coming up with new fun ideas of like, wow, it'd be cool if this spaceship had, you know, wheels and lasers. Uh, And, you know, uh, fast forward 40 years and here we are. Uh, It's been, uh, I I ended up choosing a career in physics, mostly because uh, in college, uh, the physics department was the only department with a machine shop in the basement. So if you chose to go into physics, then they teach you how to use the mill and the lathe and uh, the arc welder and, and all the other great, really exciting, you know, good real tools uh, that were down in the basement. So, uh, you know, on the basis of that, I was like, well, gosh, easiest choice ever, right? I get to use a mill and a lathe. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so here we are, right? It's uh, uh, It's been a great opportunity to work on a bunch of fun projects. The, the ones that you mentioned are all been um, really, uh, really dramatic and fun and, and really rewarding project to be able to work on. The Perseverance rover, as you know, successfully now operating on Mars for uh, more than a month. Uh, we get fresh data from that every night, and it's, it's just fascinating. It's working beautifully. Um, a credit to the enormous effort from the gigantic team that's uh, that's responsible for that rover, of which I'm a very small part. Uh, but just the same, it's a real honor to work on that project. Uh, the work that I think we'd like to talk about today is is, is quite different from that, in fact. Um, and for another project that I've been uh, developing here at the laboratories for uh, for quite some time, uh, which is using a set of techniques and technologies that exploit the, the weirdness of quantum mechanics uh, to be able to provide information security, communication security, to ensure, uh, try and defeat and prevent hacking. So uh, I'm looking forward to being able to talk about that. Uh, both here with you now and also tomorrow evening, excuse me, I should say Wednesday evening at six o'clock at a Frontiers in Science uh, talk uh, that's being hosted by the laboratory. Great. Well, let's talk about that. The Frontiers in Science uh, lecture series is going to be Wednesday, May 26th at 6 p.m. And I know that this is something that um, our listening audience and can go to. Uh, what a wonderful uh, lecture series. Uh, Frontiers in Science virtual talk protecting the power grid with physics uh, with you, Dr. Newell. Now, this is free. It is via WebEx, so people can sign online. Go to lanl.gov slash museum uh, to listen uh, to your lecture series. But uh, kind of cue up the conversation for us, if you will, uh, about what you intend to discuss in this lecture series. Well, thanks. I'd I'd be happy to. The, uh, The work that we've been doing here is focused on uh, securing the communication and control signals that are used to uh, to control electric power across the grid. Uh, the nation's electric power supply uh, is uh, is through this uh, gigantic, incredibly complicated layered network of electricity generation, uh, transmission, and distribution. 
And uh, we're currently going through nationwide a tremendous change in the way that is done. This is both because of a, uh, a much larger at scale deployment of renewable energy, solar and wind, of course, um, are, are all you know, really becoming a much larger portion of the nation's generation portfolio. Uh, as we retire older technologies, uh, those are also changing the portfolio. And also looking towards the future, we anticipate a much larger, larger deployment of uh, electric vehicles, right? We, we've recently seen uh, about a month ago now, General Motors announced that they have plans to completely retire internal combustion engines from the fleet. Uh, you know, that's not a today thing. That's not a tomorrow thing. That's five to 10 to 15 years into the future. But you know, we at Los Alamos, are, are, you know, our mission is to be thinking about and preparing for the world of the future. And as part of that, it's time to upgrade the national electric grid. Uh, upgrading the grid includes upgrading all of the control signals and computers that are used to uh, turn things on and off, uh, adapt to changing conditions, uh, mitigate and respond to interruptions and problems when they occur. And as we build these systems, it's crucially important to make sure that we do not unintentionally also build in vulnerabilities. We don't want to create a network that gives, you know, gives power and control to uh, the intended users, but that also allows uh, anyone else, those who wish us ill, to have that same level of control. So we must isolate uh, and protect these signals um, that, that monitor and control power flow uh, from adversarial use. When we first started planning, oh, sorry, please go ahead. I was going to say, we've seen recently in the news um, a pipeline affected uh, okay. when we talk about uh, energy delivery and infrastructure uh, okay. being uh, something that can, you know, be uh, infrastructure that's attacked. And when we think of our utility grid and we think of how to keep our utility grid safe uh, and its importance uh, because of the health, safety, and welfare of people in general, of the safety and security of our country, I can't think of a more important uh, topic and conversation than this one that we're having right now. Well, thank you for that. You, you, you're entirely right. When we first, several weeks ago now, started planning uh, the talk that, that I'll be giving on Wednesday at six o'clock, uh, it was, it, it felt esoteric, like, oh my goodness, how are we going to be able to convince people that this is worth caring about, much less spending decades researching and, you know, taxpayer dollars and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, now that's, that's I'm sorry to say, that's a pretty easy story to tell um, due to the, the, the really unfortunate and, and impactful uh, cyber attack on uh, the business systems that surround the Colonial Oil Pipeline. That's that correct. took place two Fridays ago now and really had a tremendous disruption on gasoline distribution on the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, the entire East Coast was, uh, was impacted by uh, by crooks, frankly, by, by plain old ordinary pirates who were hoping to take something of value for, for a hostage and keep it for ransom, and they were successful in doing so. That's not okay. Uh, it's important that we work now and in the future to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Now, um, Dr. Newell, we uh, have seen also in the news what can happen when an energy grid uh, goes offline. Um, okay. I know we're talking about cyber attacks and, and safety, mm -hmm. uh, and keeping our utility grids safe from hackers. Mm -hmm. But this last winter, we saw right. in Texas what was done to the citizens there when their utility grid failed uh, because of the weather. Um, not much that they could do about that. But um, when the power went down, uh, the big impact to the health, safety, and welfare of the public there. Now, when you throw cyber attacks into something like that, we can just see what damage can be done. Well, it's uh, that's right. I mean, we I, I regard the the, the weather-related uh, service interruption that took place in Texas, uh, which is really tragic. I mean, really unfortunate and very impactful. It's a sobering reminder, right? It's a really stark illustration of the extent to which our modern daily lives are um, are, are really highly dependent on these many layers of infrastructure, right? I mean, the two examples here are completely different and yet closely exactly. related. Gasoline and electric power are all things that we basically count on. We assume are present at all times and at reasonable cost throughout all of our daily lives. And when that assumption is, is thrown into question, it becomes very disruptive very, very quickly. So keeping our energy energy grid uh, up and running, safe mm -hmm. from hackers, uh, protecting the energy grid, um, 
all of that, uh, just uh, so very important. I want to ask you, mm-hmm. how can this be done uh, yeah. with uh, physics yeah. in the quantum world? Because I find quantum physics very fascinating. Um, it is uh, next next level thinking, definitely. Um, and uh, trying to uh, wrap my mind around how this can be done is another uh, feat in and of itself. So how does, how does this happen? So it's, it's a great question. If I could uh, just briefly uh, sure. make the point that the the laws of quantum mechanics, the laws of physics, are the laws of things that are incredibly, incredibly small. And they're very different from what we experience and expect in our daily lives, right? The physical laws that dictate, you know, baseballs, locomotives, space shuttles, things that are human scale are completely different from the way things behave uh, when they get to, the, you know, single atoms, single photons, things that are tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, and in particular, what we're used to in our daily lives is that information can be copied, duplicated, uh, subdivided, uh, and, and read without any problem. And quantum mechanics doesn't allow that. Uh, it's really strange that the way the universe is made is such that at the quantum level, at the world of the very, very small, you cannot actually make an exact copy of something. We have something called the, the no cloning theorem that says it's impossible to make a perfect copy of an unknown quantum state. Uh, It's also impossible to cut something in half. The whole point of quantum mechanics is that uh, there exists a a set of things so small they cannot be subdivided further, right? There's no such thing as half an electron. There's no such thing as half a photon. Uh, And then furthermore, this part is really weird, is that quantum mechanics tells us even looking at something, even making a measurement, trying to extract any kind of information from a system, just by trying to look at it, will change it permanently and forever. And that's odd, uh, but it also is the way the universe is. Uh, and it's true like that for us, and that's true for any any adversary, anyone who might wish us well. So if you'll permit a little bit of hand-waving and some, you know, some finger physics, uh, I'll say that because you can't make a copy, you can't cut anything in half, and because even looking at a system will change it, I'll argue that quantum mechanics is very well suited for secret communications, right? Anyone who looks at it will change it in a way that we that, that the users can measure. Nobody can make a perfect copy. Nobody could take a piece and keep it for themselves. And so on the basis of this, we use single photons, which are single particles of light. Just basically think of taking a laser and turn it way down until it makes one photon at a time. And then use those single photons and their quantum mechanical properties to create uh, secret messages and then transmit those around the electric grid. We've done this at the laboratory. We've shown that we can do it in other power utilities as well. You know, one, what's fascinating to me is that the um, fluctuations in the the energy grid, you had talked about renewable mm-hmm. energy and mm-hmm. uh, energy that comes from different generation sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being able to monitor the behavior of a, of a energy grid, of a utility system, um, and being able to use... Um, cutting edge techniques that you talked about with these particles of light for encryption. And I believe uh, you had said authentication, but right. being able to do something like that in the middle of all of these fluctuating variables yeah. is pretty uh, impressive to me. Well, thank you. It, um, you know, I think our timing on this project is, is, is good uh, because as you say, uh, the grid is going through a lot of changes, right? A, a lot of new technologies are being tested, deployed, and and really we're, we're in the process of defining the future. You, you mentioned uh, the use of renewables, right? One of the biggest concerns, not concerns, but one of the biggest challenges with renewable energy is that uh, we're not in control of when it arrives, right? When if, you, if a lot of the power is coming from a solar panel, well, of course, you get a lot more during the middle of the day than in the evenings. Uh, in uh, in New Mexico and in much of the rest of the country, a lot of electric power consumption is in the evening when we all get home and turn on our air conditioners. And so, taking this you know huge generation capacity, which peaks at noon, uh, makes all that electricity in the middle of the day. But you want to use it at four or five or six in the evening, right? Requires some uh, management and control, and in some cases even storage. So the laboratories uh, in another separate set of projects that I'm not involved with, but but collaborate on. 
uh, is developing you know, storage technologies. Okay, well, that's great, but we need to be able to turn those on and off. We need to monitor them. Um, you know, lar very large banks of batteries control or contain an enormous amount of power. It's important that they're safe and maintained and controlled in a way that is um, uh, that's done by the folks who mean well as opposed to otherwise. Great. Well, why don't we just pause for a moment to let our listening audience know that we're talking with Dr. Raymond Newell. And uh, Frontiers in Science virtual talk is going to be held on Wednesday, May 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Uh, it is free. It is a virtual event. Uh, so you can sign up to uh, listen uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, conversation that's going to be held. Dr. Newell, what are some of the takeaways that you hope people walk away from the lecture series with? Well, um, great. I, I, this particular talk, I think one of the biggest things, messages we'd like to, to bring across is that uh, Los Alamos and other national laboratories have been recognizing for uh, for more than a decade, that uh, as we improve uh, and modernize the systems that control electric power, uh, we need to make them more secure. We recognize that there are real threats that do come from uh, uh, malicious cyber actors, right? You can't take something you care about a whole lot and just put it on the open internet and hope for, hope for a good outcome. Um, so we've been using the uh, some really new and cutting edge techniques in cryptography, which is the science of secret codes, as well as these physical techniques that we've talked about, uh, encoding information onto single photons and exploiting some, some really unusual behavior in the way the universe handles information uh, in quantum mechanics uh, to be able to do this. So, you know, this is a technique that we've developed and been working on here at Los Alamos for a long time, really in anticipation of the need, recognizing that Things like the Colonial Pipeline hack have been coming all along, uh, and, it's, and we've been working for quite some time uh, to, to develop technologies to meet that need and to address these problems. Now, as far as our utility companies are concerned, I, I guess my question is, and I know many utilities have their own individual SCADA systems. They try to have a certain amount of firewall protection, so to speak, right. or mm -hmm. uh, from, from, from the internet, but there's always points that you know, hackers can try to um, permeate into the system. Is this technology that we're talking about something that can be uh, adopted readily uh, by our utility companies in the future? Is there something that they're going to have to do on their end to maybe retrofit the system for this mm -hmm. type of technology? What what can we expect that they may need to do? That's a great question. The, the systems that we've been building and testing here at Los Alamos are – uh, because this is a, an optical technology, it does require an optical link between the communicating nodes. So that means fiber optics. Uh, fortunately, quite a lot of utilities, both here in New Mexico locally uh, and nationwide, uh, utilities have installed a lot of optical fiber already. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, by the time you've paid for you know, the cherry picker truck and the team full of men and women to go out there and linesmen to go and install all the all the equipment and the cables, the cost of adding optical fiber to that is not very much once you've already paid for the truck and the people. So the optical fiber is in many cases already there. Uh, the systems that we build, uh, we call them a bump in the wire retrofit, meaning that we take in all of the existing communication equipment that the utilities have already paid for and are already using and add, uh, add our technology. Uh, to the translator, basically take take the signals that exist and are currently sent in an insecure way, secure them, and then send them over the optical fiber that already exists. So this is a hardware solution. It does require purchasing and installing some parts, uh, and we've been working very hard uh, for the past four or five years to reduce the cost of these systems so that they can become uh, affordable at very large scale. You know, this is technology that, you know, if it you know, our first few generations of this stuff, you know, filled a room and then it filled a trailer and then it filled a refrigerator and then it filled a suitcase. And now we're working on systems that are smaller and smaller and yet more cost effective still. Well, uh, Dr. Newell, I th think this is a really fascinating conversation. In particular, when we talk about the health, safety and welfare of, of, of people, mm -hmm. when we think of um, our uh, folks that live in hot places like Arizona during the summer, yeah. maybe live in cold places during the winter. Um, fluctuations in the energy grid, uh, the securities of utmost importance to not only our, our 
health, safety, and welfare, but to all of our small businesses, to our exactly. larger companies. Uh, so uh, very fascinating conversation. Wanting to remind our listening audience that you can um, go to lanl.gov slash museum. That's lanl.gov slash museum. Uh, and sign up for the Frontiers in Science virtual talk with Dr. Raymond Newell, Protecting the Power Grid with Physics. Um, this Wednesday, May 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, Dr. Uh, Newell, any final thoughts for our listening audience today? Well, I just want to say thank you uh, for the support and interest. Uh, it's great to be able to share uh, some of the work that we do here at Los Alamos. Uh, you know, Los Alamos has a, a huge amount of people here working on uh, interesting and important relevant problems, uh, both nationwide uh, and for the whole world. So I feel honored to be uh, able to share some of that work, uh, really a small fraction of all the good stuff that goes on here uh, with our friends, family and neighbors in northern New Mexico. Well, many thanks to you, Dr. Newell, and to your colleagues, to all the women and men that work at Los Alamos National Laboratory for the work that you do to protect our country and uh, make our lives better and safer. Thank you very much. And again, folks, sign up. Go to uh, lanl.gov slash museum. Appreciate it, Dr. Newell. Hope to uh, talk with you again sometime. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you.